Hi everyone, Donut here, and what we're doing right now is driving over to a business called Concept Arms Firearm Solutions, which is a gunsmithing business run by one of my good friends and fellow veteran Brock Travis. Now the reason I wanted to go talk to these guys is due to current events, the media has a lot of things wrong about how easy it is to get a rifle and the background checks, and we're going to talk to someone who has an FFL about the process that you must go through to get one of those scary, scary assault rifles. But while we're driving over there, I want to say thank you to everyone who tuned in for live Sovereign Citizen Bingo with Angry Cops last night. It was hilarious and it was very, very fun for everyone. A little bit about Concept Arms. It is a full service gunsmithing business, which means they can do anything that relates to guns. They have their own lathes and mills and I don't know shit about machining, but they have anything they need to make basically any part of a gun. Let's say if you bring a gun in that has a discontinued part, well, they can just make a new part for it. Brock and his partner, James, who run the business, went to school for several years to learn how to do this stuff. One of their final projects for class was to build their own gun from scratch. Brock and his partner, James, just opened the gunsmithing business up within the past year, and they're already doing pretty good. I'm going to go ahead and say that they're probably some of the best gunsmiths here in South Carolina. I want to go ahead and thank them also for letting me come into their place of business and bother them with cameras today. While we are driving over there, let's talk about some of the future projects that might be coming up. We'll be talking with a narc this weekend. I can't show him on camera, but uh, we can hear some funny stories as a guy I used to police with. I tweeted to Black Rifle Coffee Company asking them if I could come hang out, and they said, yeah, come hang out. So. That might happen sometime. I think that's probably the thing I'm most excited about. They just released a new video showing uh, you know, Evan Hafer and Matt Best going fishing and it was really, really freaking cool. Uh, now away. one thing, if we start traveling, yeah. uh, Grizzly is in the back right now, in the back, like, uh, backyard. Yeah. So if we have, if after you go out of the building, we're gonna have to like pause because Grizzly bites people in the that's face. Fine. Cause, somebody, cause I mean, somebody walked back here. Yeah. We didn't hear them come in, and they walked in. The, they just walked right in the back of the shop, and usually bit them in their face. Brock here was just telling me a story about how you don't walk into the back without them because their guard dog grizzly bit somebody in the face. All right, so I'm joined here by Mr. Brock Travis, uh, Concept Arms Firearm Specialist, and he is a certified gunsmith. Went to school for a very long time, right? Yeah. How long did you go to school to do this? Two years, twelve hours a day. Two years, 12 hours a day, he went to school to do pretty much everything that you can do to a firearm. And uh, he said I could come out and videotape his, his area, take a look at their shop. And uh, that's, what, that's what we're here doing right now. And we're going to hear some stories about stupid gun owners. And he, he was telling me a few minutes ago, it's pretty, pretty good stuff. And we're going to take a, a tour of their shop. Tell us some dumb things that people do to their guns. Well, let's see. In the past week... Uh, we had one guy come in, and he brought in a semi-automatic shotgun, mm -hmm. okay? And a semi-automatic shotgun generally has a trigger pull between like four and six pounds, right? And what he was doing was he's getting this gun ready to give to his child, who yeah. is like eight or ten or something like that, wasn't it? Yeah. And uh, so he said, what, what did he want done to that thing? He just wanted it... Uh, drilled and tapped for a scope Drilled mount. and tapped, yeah. He wanted like a tactical uh, scope mount, like a red dot on it. For his eight-year-old? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. Okay. So we had to, we essentially made a custom rail for this thing so that he could mount a red dot on it. Yeah. And when I was, I had to take the whole thing apart to mill on everything and drill and tap on the receiver. When I was getting the thing back together, the trigger kept going off on me. I'm like, what the hell is going on here? And so I ended up finally getting back together and tested the trigger pull. The trigger pull was at 10 ounces. Yeah, it's a, it's a quite a low trigger pull. For if this, okay, let me put it this way. If this kid, bang, 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 daddy, look how good I did. Set the rifle down, mm -hmm. blow his head off. Yeah. If he just tap Barely the back it. of it, it's going and, off. And dad had done that. And so I called dad, I'm like, hey, uh, I don't know if you know if this trigger was, you know, tampered with. He's like, oh yeah, I, I set that trigger like that. I was like, okay. <laughs> oh God. So you want, you want to, you want this to be like this. He's like, yeah, you know, I wanted to get ready for my kid to shoot. And I was like, you, do you, you're getting this gun ready for this kid to blow his head off is what you're doing or yours. We reset it. Uh, he just took some dikes and cut the spring because I guess he, 
watch the YouTube video. <laughs> watch, watch the YouTube video about it. <laughs> and uh, so we put it back to factory. On Springs, we also had a guy watch another YouTube video. Hmm. Uh, he watched a video on how to replace your sear spring on a Smith & Wesson uh, semi-automatic mm -hmm. with a spring out of a big pen. <laughs> and nice. Another one of the, another so, one. So someone on YouTube said that's okay to take a spring out of a big pen. Yes. And put, Jesus Christ. Yes. We went to school for two years, 12 hours a day in the shop, learn how, learning how to gunsmith. Our first week of gunsmithing was we had to hand make our own hand tools mm -hmm. to five thousandths of an inch tolerance in the yeah. first week. Second, like by the end of the first month, we were doing two thousandths tolerance just with a file and sandpaper. That's nuts, man. So when you start getting into you know dealing with tolerances on sear springs and yeah. triggers and connectors and disconnectors and all that jazz that goes into the firearm, I mean, it's not you can't just go taking a pen apart and putting a sp that spring in your gun. You've heard it here, folks. If the YouTubes tells you to put big springs in your gun, don't do it. Oh, and by the way, I get all the comments. These are not all pins, okay? These are pen <laughs> <drivers>. Nerd. <laughs> <laughs> Flashlights and stuff. Do you, do you know what the Sharpie's good for? What? When you're doing precision machining, if you put Sharpie on something, you can touch off and it'll be within a thousandths uh, touched off. Oh. Cool. Actually like learning learning some new tricks. Heck yeah. You guys made that? Yeah. Nice. They make a bunch of cool stuff here. That actually used to be Little Brock's baseball bat. He kind of got mad at me actually for making it. <laughs> he got mad at you for taking this bat? I deal with it, yeah. Okay. I used, to, I used to carry that in the military. That was step one. With the sledgehammer? Yeah, I had to go to sensitivity training for creating a hostile work environment, whatever. <laughs> What about the uh, what about the stubby little shotgun right here? It's not a oh, shotgun. That's not a shotgun. What? That is a firearm. Oh, okay. It's Mossberg. It's Mossberg. Mossberg and Remington came up with a way to skirt the whole under 18 inch rule. Yeah. Uh, and so they came up with a way to make the receiver and handle and and everything so that it's according to the ATF it's a firearm so that it could be a 14 inch yeah barrel. But if you do anything to that thing, you're going to be you're gonna be in trouble. Yeah, you're okay. You can get your soul butt left. <laughs> it's hard to keep a gunsmithing shop clean, mainly because of James. But yeah. <laughs> uh, we do a little bit of everything. Yeah. From pretty much any type of handwork at our benches, a lot of disassembly, a lot of cleaning, a lot of sanding, uh, a lot of discovering things that are just absolutely atrocious and having to fix them. Yeah. Most from, of what most of what we do, most of what we do is clean up after other gunsmiths. Yeah. That do it out of their garage, do it out of their basement. Um, from YouTube. Yeah. yeah. Like people <laughs> welding on bolt handles. Okay. And stuff like well, excuse me, bolt sleeves like on those BARs. Yeah. This is kind of our pride and joy here. Uh, this is our lathe where we do a lot of the precision uh, barrel work where we'll thread barrels for compensators and suppressors. We'll uh, exchange barrels, you know, threading a new barrel tenion, our precision chambering. Yeah. Most of what we do on our lathe is under one thousandths. Uh, generally it's between under two tenths of a thousandth of an inch. So it's, if I were to, this, this lathe is level is such that if I were to put my hand or lean on this, it would throw off the level about a thousandth of an inch. So when we're working on this, we kind of let her let her ride. Drill presses to solvent tanks, grinders, lathe, bench stuff, um, oven, bead blasters. Yeah, that's that's, that. that's actually used. Um, sand blasters, everything. Uh, and then if we go back here, you, James, you want to get grizzly? Oh, yeah. I don't want to get bit in the face. He wants to bite your face. Yeah. And he said he was on death row for biting people. Yes. <laughs> That's a perfect shop dog. Man. Yeah. Uh, so this looks kind of messy, but it should 
this is a bluing tanks. We do uh, what and they call it in a machine shop uh, black oxide. Mm -hmm. You're essentially converting FeO2 rust to FeO3, uh, which is what gives your firearm that black finish. Uh, that's essentially starts out as rust. So we have a process that we can blue carbon steel, stainless steel. We can parkerize um, our anodizing stuffs in there, but we can do most firearm coatings. And it's just a really messy, caustic process. It starts out, you have to completely degrease everything uh, where there's no oil or anything like that in the metal. And then um, you put it in this tank, it chemically sterilizes the surface of the metal, which then you rinse that off and then you put in your blooming salts, which are at 285 to 290 degrees. And it's just essentially uh, uh, lye and uh, ammonium nitrate. Uh, sodium nitrate. Sodium, yeah, sodium nitrate. And so then that is what actually blues the firearm after that. It goes into a boil out where you boil all those salts off and then you put it in oil. And it's just a really nasty, messy process. And if you yeah. were walk in here with all the tanks running, it'd be 120 degrees and your face, your skin would burn. Huh. Yeah, so it's pretty good. That's cool. why most people don't, that's why they came out with cold blue, and cold blue sucks. And it smells like rotten eggs, and it doesn't do a very good job. This does a good job. It's just hard and expensive. Yeah, that's cool, man. Uh, and, and yeah, so this is kind of what we do back here. It's just a nasty process. <laughs> so this is a Winchester 94, and it's got a serial number that's below above two million seven hundred thousand. So it is one that they say is unblueable. Yeah. But we can pretty much do anything because we're magical and that comes in the form of electrolysis. Yeah, you heard it here folks, they're magical. Yes, we have magic fingers. Come to Concept Arms with their magic fingers. <laughs> this is a Remington Model 11 that we're oh, yeah, restoring. Right. It was yeah. spent like 20 years in a barn, so it's a lot of rust and a lot of pitting that had to come out. That's not the 11, is it? Hours and hours of filing. That's not the 11, is it? The uh... No, not the engraved one. Uh. uh. All this was a, bat, a box of guns. This is a gun we just had sour <coughs> coated. Just had it oh, that's nice, man. Yeah, we did it. Good boy. Watch. Hey, buddy, don't buy my face. He just kind of lunges up at your face, though. And he does it kind of sneakily. Walk yeah, up so to like you all nicely. He doesn't growl. He, he, just, in the face. he just lunges at your face. Oh, okay. There's no warning. He's yeah. got to decide whether he likes you or not. Yeah. Which is kind of cool. Yeah. 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 Yeah, don't let them buy my face. <laughs> Good boy. Sometimes that we get guns that are in, in boxes and parts because people decide they want to take them apart and fix them or put them back together and it just doesn't go well for most people. So we get them in here and fix them, diagnose them, and uh, give them back a whole complete gun. Awesome, man. So that and came to you, that, is that what you said? That came one? to us in a box, so just that box right there, actually. Someone, <laughs> someone just took it apart and brought it to you? And yes. Put the whole thing back together. Did you have to make any parts for it, or yes, were you, yeah. I had to fit the connector. The connector had the wrong part, and I have to get a new collar for for this. But that'll be it. Okay. He thought he was going to be balls deep in it, and he's just not. Yeah. We're that good. Uh, these are just guns that we've got in progress right now. Some they range from. We're going to be doing a restoration on this Colt Python. This is the same exact model of the the uh, gun that Rick carries on Walking Dead. Oh, cool! Except he carries a stainless steel version, and this is the 1950s original uh, Python 357 Magnum. So we're doing a full restoration on that. Have to do some repairs, um, and a full restoration on that would inc involve completely stripping all the bluing, uh, taking out any pitting or rounded edges, making it look factory again. Yeah, and. Essentially trying to make it look like we've never been there and touched that. Oh, there he is. Uh, trying, trying to bite my face. Good boy. <laughs> Good boy. So, um, we've got stuff like that. We've got odd stuff like this. This is a German Schutzen rifle. What? It's just an odd German bench rest rifle. Yeah, yeah. It's real strange. That is strange. Yeah, real strange stuff. Good color case hardening. Worth its weight in steel. How much is it worth? Well, seven grand or so. yeah, seven. around five to seven dollars. Look at that. 
you guys do the do the bluing on it, or are you going to? What what do you have to do to it? Oh, uh, we well, yeah, that actually came in as a minor repair or cleaning, and then after that, the guy wanted to sell it after he found out how much it's worth. So yeah, I can't blame him. It is currently on Gunbroker. That is really cool, man. Uh, oh yeah, this is the one we Cerakoted. Um, this is one that we Cerakoted. We can do all the fancy stenciling and our process is very intricate for uh, all the prep of the metal, which is what sets apart a lot of people from doing a professional Cerakoting job versus not, yeah. which is metal prep. Uh, proper degreasing, proper etching of the metal. So that way the ceramic has something to actually grab, grab onto and doesn't just scrape off with your fingernail. Interesting stuff like this, which once restored, will this is this is actually has Damascus barrels on it. Mm -hmm. So if you were to look up what Damascus uh, shotguns look like, you would not see something like this. But by the time we finish this, mm -hmm. it will look like that because we can. We can card this all off and then re-etch the Damascus with some ferric, uh, ferric acid, nice. which electronic people use often as well. And then everything from minor, uh, like stock repairs, pinning uh, a stock, um, people just want their guns clean, safety checks, repairs, all the way up to custom builds where we're doing, where, where we're you know replacing barrels and rechambering for thousand yard shooters and stuff like that. Um, yeah, right there. That is a Thompson Center 410-45 uh, Colt. It's a. This just needed a screw, I think, in the rib, just a minor repair. But a lot of times you can't find parts for guns, yeah. so you got to take it to a gunsmith because a lot of the difference between a armor and a gunsmith is an armor can replace the screw, a gunsmith can make the screw. And for a lot of older uh, firearms, you can't buy the stuff anymore, so we just make it. Um, there's there's a big difference, you know, to, between a gunsmith and a somebody who claims to be. Um, there's a Tac 14. That's a uh, version of the Mossberg Shockwave. Same thing. It's just a Remington version. And then we do a lot of trigger jobs on like revolvers and stuff like this. Uh, this is a lot of elderly women, they buy guns like this because it doesn't have all the bells and whistles as like a semi-automatic does. Mm -hmm. And they just want to be able to pull the trigger. And so the downside is that most of the time these triggers are um, really heavy between like 10 and 13 pounds. Yeah. And what we do is we go in, take it apart, we polish everything to like a mirror finish. So that way it's just super smooth. So when you pull that trigger, when you pull the trigger, it's just glass smooth. Yeah. And it we take them down to about eight or nine pounds uh, reliably, so that way you get really good primer strikes. Uh, no light primer strikes like you could. This is, I think we set this one to like eight and three quarters or nine pounds, double action pull. Mm -hmm. And it's just glass smooth and you could run some mag tech in here and still get. I did this stock, uh, it takes about Generally around 15 hand rub coats to get get it smooth like this, where all the pores are filled in the wood, um, and that's you know from shaping like with a rasp. Uh, another good example, like our we've got a couple rifles in these cases right here, custom rifles that uh, James and I built, where that wood, for example, was. A stick when we got it. There was just nothing there. We did all the shaping, um, all the inletting, African black woods. There was a lot of custom. We did the, uh, the barrel was a blank when we got it. The action was a 80% action when we got it. So we did all the final fit and finish, color case hardening, lots of little bells and whistles on there. James made his own uh, peep sights out of just raw, raw stock, which is pretty impressive. You guys made these from scratch. Yeah. Yeah. That's really cool. Man. And those are like a custom fit tuxedo. It's not like something you buy. It's fits me. This was your, you said it was your final project, right? Yeah. 
something like that. So this this is this is James and Brock's final projects right here, was to build their own rifles from scratch. Just kind of goes to show how good these guys are at what they do. No, we do not do bump stocks. No, they are not good for your gun. Someone asked which platform is better, the AR or the AK. I have done, I would like, I could write you a dissertation on that. Yeah. <laughs> I have studied uh, the Kalashnikov concern mm -hmm. in detail in their HVS plant and their, the whole history of the AK itself. Yeah. I think that it is a, I think I'm gonna use James's words. Um, it is a, it is a piece of farm equipment. And that's not a, that's not saying it's a bad thing. But the whole thing is riveted together. You can't really take it apart and put it back together. Yeah. It's kind of like, a, it's, it's more like a piece of farm equipment. I mean, yes, it's reliable. Yes, it'll shoot um, area targets. Uh, <laughs> but it, it doesn't have the versatility as an AR okay. uh, in terms of what it can bring to the fight. Yeah. Uh, precision, customization, um, ease of customization, and also, uh, what else? I know you've got an opinion, James. I know in muddy climates, they actually run more reliably than AKs because they're a sealed design, whereas the AK stuff can go right in it just about anywhere. Um, and so, and there's detailed testing, and I've done detailed testing on this as well. Oh, that yeah. Even with the dust cover open. You think that civilians should be able to own ARs? That's a big question. It's going around. Well, we could have a long discussion about yeah, that. Yeah, I, I, I figured. People don't need ARs. There's a reason Red Dawn's ever happened. Well, people don't need cars either. Yeah, well, of course, kill more people a year than they yeah. They didn't. That's, they that's... didn't. They didn't make a big deal about that guy who freaking stole that Home Depot truck up in New York and ran everybody down with that. Mm -hmm. That's and a what? That's a weapon of mass destruction. Ban assault trucks and right? cars are not covered yeah. under the Constitution. Yeah, they're not protected. Hmm. <laughs> hmm. I think we're going to need to ban butter knives. <laughs> <laughs> We've been talking about. Um, assault microwaves a lot on the channel because this guy threw microwaves at the police he threw a microwave at the police Dude, they're saying no we need to ban assault microwaves right now well imagine if he started hitting the ymca and you know and now we can throw two or three microwaves <laughs> in under 30 seconds that's a high rate of microwave it is, it is. that's a high rate of micro <laughs> assault microwaves <laughs> now, let me do the math real quick 30 miles an hour times 10 pounds you're looking at a good bit of foot pounds of energy. How seriously difficult is it to actually get a gun? There is a lot of, there's a lot of that are just, there's a lot of components that are just, will cut you off right away. Mm -hmm. Like your age, like your uh, criminal status, criminal background, um, all of that. If, if you, if you tell us, or if we, if we know that this is the case, it's just, no, you can't buy a gun. If we, if we know that you're not going to be owning the gun that you're buying, mm -hmm. no, it's called a straw purchase. If, yeah. if we know that this is going to be used for any sort of nefarious activity, no. If we don't like your face, no. <laughs> yeah, we can't get in trouble for discrimination. Yeah. No. We can get in trouble for not discriminating. Yes. So, that, like, have you had people, like, sketchy people walk in here and you've been like, no, we can't order that gun for you? Yeah. 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 We've had people bring in, we've had people bring guns in here where, after they left, because they've drilled out their, they've drilled out their rifling, they've filed off their serial number, yeah, and they're like, oh, my gun's broken, can you fix it? We're like, no. <laughs> no, 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 touching that thing. And then, and then we can call and report that uh, illegal firearm. Okay. So. Do, do, do people come in here and ask you to do illegal things? Yeah. Yeah. All the time. All the time? <laughs> Like all the, all the time. time, like coming in here and being like, "Hey, I want this fully automatic." Which you know, as fun as it would be, this is our livelihood. We yeah. can't, you know, we're, we would not be willing to sacrifice. We bet our lives on this. So. Yeah. The biggest thing that they could do <clears throat> to skirt the system is is individual sales. Yeah. Uh, private sales, gun shows. So a lot of time, even though even though at gun show you have you still have the same system that we have set up as far as doing background checks and everything like that. A lot of people 
they just will perform a private sale, which is, is not illegal. Mm -hmm. you, you, if I wanted to sell you one of my guns, I could sell you one of my guns. Yeah. And there'd be no documentation record because it's illegal to have a national registration of firearms. So mm -hmm. one individual can go to another individual on the street and sell their gun. Yeah. So that's one big way that people find a way around it. Um, and even if you made that illegal, are you still going to stop it? Yeah, that's true. People are still going to sell guns to each other. If you want a gun, you can get yeah. a gun. So it, it, that's where a lot of it falls on the firearm owner's responsibility to make sure they're not selling their gun to somebody that is going to go, you know, kill somebody with it. Yeah. Yes. And we all have responsibility. People, most people I've met um, and done private transfers with, <clears throat> they want to make sure that I have a CWP. They want to, um, and they'll document. Uh, bill of sale, my name, address, phone number, because that's I remember that like Bill's parking lot. Yeah, yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Uh, because that's their name. If if that gun ends up on a crime scene, what the ATF is going to do is they're going to go trace the FFLs. They're going to go from the manufacturer <clears throat> to the distributor, uh, check their FFL book, find out what FFL the distributor sold that firearm to, and go down the food chain. And if you bought that from a gun store and you sold it to some guy in a Walmart parking lot and it ends up on a crime scene, they're going to knock on your door first. So you want to be able to point them in the right direction and say, wasn't me. Yeah. Um, so the, the, there is this large way that you could skirt legally buying, like going through the official channels of buying a firearm. Mm -hmm. There's there's still individual integrity here. Yeah. And that's, you know, if we can't rely on people having integrity. Yeah, um, I, I mean, it really kind of comes down to yeah. people just not being shitty. Yes. Not being, not being a crappy human being. So this is what I was talking about. Whenever somebody purchases a firearm, we have to receive the firearm from a uh, FBI or ATF registered business. Mm -hmm. And then once we receive it, we have to have that paperwork from them. We have to fill out paperwork to receive it for at, at our business. And then once we have received the firearm, then there is a six page little packet of paperwork somebody fills out and I have to get all their two forms of ID essentially mm -hmm. uh, in this case and then uh, check their check over their paperwork make sure that it's all good fill out three of these pages of paperwork and then double check it to their information then I have to go online FBI's got a website that we that we go on and check all this information once it's all in these redundant forms of um, uh, documentation, we go on the FBI and give it all to them, which then they check over all of it on the FBI federal database mm -hmm. to make sure there's nothing crazy, right? And then once we get that back, then we can finish the paperwork and then transfer it. They're also a CWP certified instructor through SLED. Okay, so that took about what? 15, 20 minutes of just paperwork? 20 minutes, About yeah. About 20 minutes paperwork. of paperwork, and he's, like you said, he's an instructor through SLED? He's a concealed weapons permit instructor. Okay. Yeah. And this is everything we still had to go through. Wow. So Joe Schmo comes in here. We've got to go through all that 20 minute long process and check online or call in the FBI and, and basically give them all the information that we just wrote in three different places. Gotcha. So we just shot some awesome footage with Brock and James from Concept Arms Firearm Specialists. Really good dudes. It was my first time using the camera, so there were some autofocus issues, I think. Hopefully the sound's good. Uh, I'm going to go home and edit this up real quick. I talked to them a little bit also about possibly doing a gunsmithing live stream. Would any of you be interested in that, seeing live streaming on possibly my channel or them creating their own channel on Twitch and seeing them work on guns all day? I think that would be pretty cool.